from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the National Book Festival, the uh, graphic novel tent. Uh, my name is Michael Kavna. I'm a writer and cartoonist for the Washington Post, and I uh, blog daily about comics. And it is uh, my pleasure today to introduce Fred Chow. Uh, first, let me start off by saying uh, thank goodness for the weather today compared with yesterday. I hear we got blessed. So uh, what I will say, if uh, how many of you know Fred Chow's work? If you know Johnny Hero, or a good amount, at least half. Um, Fred is, uh, we're just talking about both, we're both a couple of guys who were born in San Francisco, but have spent a lot of time on the East Coast and uh, have a lot of influences. And in Fred's work, you see with Johnny Hero, half Asian, all hero, you see these influences coming through. You see he uh, spent years as a boy in Taiwan, but he also grew up watching Night Court. So you'll see all this. Um, to me, what is amazing about Fred, I've served at the San Diego Comic-Con and the Eisner's jury this year, and one thing that struck us was the lack of humor comics. And with Fred, what you see is there is this inherent humor. So he's got the action going on, but he's got this whole other meta level of humor that is fantastic. And I just wanted to read to you quickly what one reviewer, who I feel nailed what's special about Fred's work is. He said, Chow does this thing that is a kind of genius and kind of amazing and kind of not really in the realm of what I was expecting at all. He uses a narrator whose words seem to pour forth an entirely different story from what's unfolding on the panel. Uh, through art and dialogue, this, uh, the life of Johnny Hero is this frenetic mess of impossibilities. And the fact that he can write, I think that's why what he does, it's an all ages book because uh, if you can appreciate humor on one level and this tremendous ninja action, the uh, working, uh, fighting off uh, fishmongers and, uh, and anyone who would come at him and the ninja action, and, uh, and also to have a beautiful girlfriend who works in book publishing, which must endure him to all book publishers. Smart move there. Anyway, it is my pleasure to introduce Fred Chow. Wow, well that was quite a generous introduction. Um, all right, I guess I'm kind of wondering what I'm doing here at all with like Mark Helprin and Don DeLillo and Christina Garcia and Linda Berry, whose speech this morning, if anyone saw, just was mind-blowingly, amazingly funny. Um, <laughs> My name is Fred Chow. I wrote and illustrated Johnny Hero, Half Asian All Hero. Um, I'd figure I'd talk about what the book is and how I came to do it all. Um, I guess a good way to start is by showing a cartoon that my friends Ethan Ballard and I work on. It's just a small 40 second one. Stop or uh, no, is no. It, oh okay. <laughs>
Yeah, okay, cool. It's all good, no worries. <laughs> it's just, you know, a boy being chased by a giant fish through Brooklyn. It's no biggie. Um, <laughs> So, Johnny Hero is this half-Japanese, half-American kid in his early to mid-twenties, living in Brooklyn, trying to make a life as a sushi chef. Um, he met his girlfriend, Mayumi Murakami, while he was in Japan. She eventually moved to the U.S., moved in with him, and this is kind of where the story starts, in this shabby apartment in Brooklyn. Johnny is working for Mr. Masago, an incredible sushi chef, in a worn-down sushi shack in New York, because, well, there are so many incredible chefs in New York that not everyone can get noticed. Johnny's girlfriend, Mayumi, is trying to make it as an editor, but she did grow up in Japan. Um, she's fine editing stuff on paper, but English is her second language, so her bosses slightly question her abilities because when she does speak, it is a broken English. Um, she also has this good friend, Toshi, who has this obvious crush on her. And though this is no real threat to Johnny and Mayumi's relationship, Johnny can't help but be a little bit annoyed by this. Um, the thing is that this is comics. There's so much that can be included visually, so I really wanted to add some of the gregariousness and some fun. Um, Mayumi is the daughter of Ami Murakami, who used to be part of a giant, uh, who used to be part of a Japanese 1970s giant robot project called Super AOK -OK Robot. Very Power Ranger-like, or really inspired by Battle of the Planets. This robot, along with some other industrial things it would handle, has also protected Tokyo from giant monsters. In the first chapter, a Godzilla-like creature smashes through their apartment wall and kidnaps Mayumi. Not long after that, they're sued by their landlord for damages to the apartment. You know, just a very New York kind of thing. And Along with the nuttiness of giant monsters, there are sushi chefs chasing each other through the streets, to the, through the Lower East Side. There are car chases and people just smacking each other around with fish, a bit of court drama, and a fair amount of Mayor Bloomberg. <laughs> but really, what's at the heart of these stories are two young adults growing up, trying to make rent, figuring out what being on their own really means. I think this project was very much a reaction to the comics that I read growing up. Um, I, growing up, I did take in a lot of Spider-Man and X-Men, and growing older, I took in a lot of Chris Ware and Adrian Tomine. Um, I kind of wanted comics to meet somewhere in the middle. X-Men was great, but I felt like everything was like this high drama scenario. Somebody was always sacrificing their life to save the universe, you know, these impossibly heroic scenarios that were just a little too far for me to identify with. And the independent comics that I read were just beautiful, but also just very grounded in everyday reality. I kind of wanted some of that high action and fun of superhero comics, but wanted the subject matter at the core to be figuring out something that was a little more everyday, something that we could relate to a little easier. Um, something that, after all the fun, hopefully had just this smaller and more intimate resonance to it. So. A lot of the comics medium really helped me inspire Johnny, the Johnny Hero world, and really, comics have always been an important part of my life. Um, I was born in San Francisco in 1978, but spent the first five years of my life in Taiwan. Um, I moved back to the US and started kindergarten not knowing much English at all. My parents said I picked up English relatively quickly. In kindergarten, I met my best friend Ethan, who did the music and animation for that little short. Um, and he was really creative and absolutely loved drawing, and he really encouraged me to draw. We draw a lot of Star Wars-based comics together on our own, um, and we loved the comic strips that we'd read in the paper. A lot of my learning to read was through Calvin and Hobbes and Bloom County. Um, I remember hiding in the back of the library in grade school, and there was this book of E.C. Seeger's Popeye comics, and I would just hide out and read those, even though half the jokes were about the depression, and I just did not understand it. I still loved it. Um, but soon I didn't really need pictures to go with the words anymore, and I just loved reading. And essentially I loved the writing assignments that were given to me. Um, I loved stories in any medium, and English became my favorite class. When I got older and entered high school, I took drama class, and this changed so much for me. The drama teacher, you know, puts all these awkward high school kids through all these trust exercises. And for the first time, I felt like I was part of this community of friends, and I'd never felt anything like that before. Throughout this, I kept writing, and I started writing small plays. And man, did I absolutely love writing for theater. Um, 
just seeing the one act I had written performed on stage by people I trusted, that was just something that was insanely fulfilling. Um, so for college, I went to Emerson College for theater arts. My best friend throughout this whole time was still Ethan, and he was changing. He had gotten super into meditation and observation. He gave me a book called The Zen of Seeing by Frederick Franck, and it really changed my outlook on drawing. I completely stopped drawing creatively and just went observational. I would draw mountains and trees and buildings and streets. I drew friends sitting around drinking coffee. I was, if you'll totally pardon the cheesy romanticism, breathing in through the eyes and exhaling through the hands, just observing and letting go. And though my drawing went this way, I was still creative in all my writing. Um, at Emerson, I concentrated on playwriting, but soon wanted a bit of a change. I started taking in classes for, writing literature, for the writing literature and publishing major, more prose writing, but then essentially changed my major because I wanted something a little more practical under my belt, so I went into film. I did some writing for short film and a little bit of directing as well, but the important part for me was learning how to switch out film and how to edit and splice film rolls together, something that, I don't know, if I was spending this much money, I wanted it to feel technical and practical in some way. So. A little bit after I graduated, the movie Office Space came out, and Office Space was one of the first bigger movies to use digital recording that really succeeded. Right after that, a lot of the production companies switched over to digital, and, well, my changing film rolls on a Bullock's camera in the dark wasn't useful at all anymore, so I had no idea what to do from that point. Um, so, you know, just got a job waitering. Um, in my spare time, I started writing more prose, mostly short stories. Um, I remember the National Novel Writing Month project came out, and I decided to participate in that, and I got about half a novel out in a month. Um, it was not well written in any way whatsoever, but the editing would be done later. Um, I moved to Brooklyn, and in the first couple months, my apartment got broken into, and among other things, my laptop was stolen. I lost all my writing, my one-act plays, the little screenplays I had done, the short stories. This was a big one for me. Um, there was, I absolutely don't think there was anything, anything at all amazing in there, but it was where I put all my effort. It was where I put all my extra time, and that's just a hard thing to lose. So I decided to switch over to comics. I just figured, if anyone broke into my place ever again, they'd never want to steal my cheesy pictures. I had very little money at the time, and instead of drawing on archival Bristol board, I'd take cheap Xerox paper from the offices that I temped at, and I eventually finished the first issue of the Johnny Hero comic, a small 32-page, beginning, middle, end, stapled comic that could be expanded upon if any publisher was ever interested. Um, it was kind of fun getting creative in my drawing again, but those things that Ethan helped me concentrate on, the, the moments where you'd stop and take in what's around you really affected me. And in this crazy comic book with robots and giant monsters, um, I just loved drawing the New York neighborhoods in the background, the telephone poles and Brooklyn brownstones and fire escapes. I, I thought that just creating that sense of what was around you and that sense of place was just so incredibly important. Um, so I sent it out to a couple independent publishers, and after a couple months, Chris Pitzer at Ad House Books got back to me. He said he liked it and wondered if I'd be up for making some more. Um, so after my day job, I would just work into the night drawing. I came out with another 32-page stapled comic, and in that first year, Johnny Hero was nominated for a couple Will Eisner Comic Book Industry Awards, including Best Writer and Artist for Humor, which I was completely blown away by. Um, but I still needed to make rent and still was working a nine to five job. And after a couple months, I just couldn't draw that fast. I just couldn't keep up with that many pages anymore. So I slowed down to a more comfortable rate. And after maybe two years, I finally finished up enough pages to collect into a book. And Ad House published that. Um, and that year, um, I guess a chapter was selected for the Best American Comics, which um, got it out there a little bit more. Um, at that time, this literary agent who also lived in Brooklyn walks into my neighborhood comic book shop and he asks the store owners for their recommendations. And among other books, they give him mine. 
he really liked it and called it and called me up. And Johnny Hero was sold to Tor Books for reprinting. And it was republished in 2012. Um, I'm working on a second book with Tor right now called Johnny Hero, The Skills to Pay the Bills. And uh, <laughs> it... It should be out this November, and the whole experience, like just working with an editor that I trust, is has just been amazing. Um, as as great as this sounds, comics still can't pay rent for me. Um, during all this, I got a job at working as a freelance book designer, and one of my regular gigs with, was with the large children's book company. I read a lot of the stuff that I helped design, and I couldn't help but react to a lot of it. I noticed. Um, a lot of dumbing down of content, um, especially taking out jokes that might go above kids' heads. I guess I felt this was a bit weird since I grew up reading so much Bloom County and Calvin and Hobbes. I mean, how many of the Reagan jokes do you think I really understood at nine years old? You know, there was plenty I didn't get until I reread those comics at a, lar at a later age. But that's also, I think, one of the things I really appreciate about those comics. It made the comics so much richer. And I wanted to make something like that on my own. So I wrote and illustrated a children's comic book called uh, Allison and a Rainy Day Robot. It's this girl who just gets bored on a rainy day, builds a robot to help her have fun, and the robot suggests completely boring things. And they just have to learn how to get along, I guess, just being bored together. <laughs> I put it through Kickstarter and got enough funding to publish it on my own. Um, I'm working with a small distributor now. It's gotten into some comic book stores, but it's been a long process, but it's been teaching me a lot about the publishing world from working with printers to distribution to essentially just kind of starting a small business. It's, this project has been a lot more than just the creative aspects of, of making a book. Um, it's learning all the aspects of the book publishing industry, which has meant a lot to me because I do love books so much. Um, I, I had a difficult time deciding whether or not I was going to talk about this, but um, the last couple of years were really hard for me. Um, I had a lot of small headaches that were really affecting me, and it had been going on for maybe two, three years, but I'd just written them off as headaches. Um, I needed a change of pace. And I moved out of New York and moved back to California last December. Um, I stayed with my mom and dad. We all took a vacation together. And on my flight back, I had a seizure. Um, and I had another one a couple days later while I was sleeping. It was really scary just waking up with blood over my, all over my pillow and you know this huge rip in my tongue. And uh, I felt more rested than I'd ever felt before. And that was obviously not normal. Um, I went to see my doctor, and it turns out I have epilepsy. Um, all those headaches I'd been having over the years, he said, were small seizures. And finally, I started having larger grand mals. Um, the doctor put me on medication. I had a really hard time adjusting, but for the most part, I'm good. I'm doing what I need to to stay healthy, and I'm super grateful that there are medications for this. Um, the thing that does suck <laughs> about being on meds is focus is really hard for me. Um, I can't work for hours just writing and drawing the way I used to. I'm certainly slower at drawing. Um, it's made me approach what I do in a whole different way. With Johnny Hero, I really wanted the characters to grow in this organic way. Um, I wanted to watch Johnny and Mayumi's slight, slow growth as a couple. I wanted to watch Johnny's interaction with his boss, Mr. Masago, change as Johnny earned his trust. I wanted to watch Toshi, Mayumi's friend who has a crush on her, change as he really came to see how much Johnny cared for Mayumi. I wanted to explore Johnny's relationship with his folks, see how that changed as he grew older. Under all the action adventure nuttiness, all the robots and fish and car chases and Bloomberg, I wanted the small nuances of relationships changing. Um, but on meds, I just don't have the time to tell all that anymore. I'm much slower with my drawing now. I can't get as much done. And of course, I still want to make comics. And it just, it's made me think, it's made me like reapproach how I tell stories. It's made me rethink a lot of storytelling for me. Um, my approach just isn't slight anymore. I really have to decide now what I need to say, what I absolutely need to get out there. Um, I don't want to be overdramatic about it. I don't want to see people sacrificing themselves or the world will blow up. But I do need to figure out 
how I need to say what I need to say within a limited amount of pages. I wish I could be more organic. I wish I could let the characters do their own thing, but I, I just don't have the time for that right now. Um, these stories, they're all written for people I love. Um, Johnny Hero was written for Dylan. Um, the second Johnny Hero book um, is dedicated to certain friends. Allison and her rainy day robot was written for my little sister. She was going through her own thing at the time and seeing her, just how much her face lit up when I gave that book to her, that was just something else. Um, I have stories from my older sister and my mom and dad and other friends and relatives. And I guess I just want certain people to know how they've affected my life and how deeply they've affected my life. And the book, I guess, because they've been so important to me, it just seems like like a way to tell them that just feels kind of lasting. Um, when I was 26, 27, living in New York, you know, I felt like I had all the time in the world and like I was, you know, everything was open, every possibility was there. And, um, you know, I'm 35 now and growing up and, you know, dealing with income and healthcare and, you know, all that stuff, you know, growing up, my responsibilities are different. And what I want long term is different. Um, I guess I'm really feeling that and I'm seeing that make its way into my work. At the crux of Johnny Hero is this really simple story. Um, I was actually very afraid that it wasn't interesting or specific enough a scenario. Um, but the response I got was one of, I guess, appreciation for telling a simpler story, just watching everyday relationships slowly develop, um, just watching what it takes to get by. Like, people really appreciated something that was easily relatable, but also meaningful. Like these smaller things that we feel every day, when, when we take a moment to step back and look at it, it's, it's all part of this very moving thing. Um, the daily stuff that we go through just, I think in our minds feels so easily forgettable um, that, that we kind of need to fill it with a sense of meaning, but we can't forget that on its own, it is meaningful. None of us have it figured out. We all need to grow. And a lot of that growth we go through comes from unfortunate situations. But hopefully from that, we can create some good writing or some good art or something good that just feels honest, something that will create an understanding through what we, through the experiences we go through. Um, I don't know, I guess just thinking about this all, I, I can't help but think that you're just amazing. Like, the stories we got as simple and ordinary as they might seem sometimes mean something deeply to someone else. And communicating that or creating that understanding is so important. Um, your stories are amazing. Your every day when you step back is just absolutely amazing. And I guess just know that. I guess that's it. If you got any uh, <laughs> questions or crap, I'm here to answer. But otherwise, Hi. or I could just dance. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you could just continue dancing. I don't mind getting I saw my you groove wrangle on. up the stairs before. That was that was hot. <laughs> that was hot. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about because I really do love um, this sort of nice middle ground between something that's humorous and that has kind of a, um, a sense of wonder to it, mm -hmm. and then also grounding it uh, with these sort of more realistic type things. Sorry, this like glare is super crazy, oh. so I'm just gonna do this, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I was just kind of wondering because, and it really um, very touched that you would share your personal um, experiences with us that kind of gives us a better idea for what stories you're making, how you're making them, and what it takes to actually create and get these things out to us. Um, and so I wondered if you, you know, might make something that's more firmly grounded in realism, like you mentioned Chris Ware before, and it must be a real thrill to be put into Best American Comics, but had you thought about making something that swings a little more towards that end of the spectrum? And if not, you know, what are you planning on doing more, like just in straight the straight comics realm? 
Um, and, there, and thanks, and we love you. So thank you. <laughs> there are a couple things that um, I'm definitely doing much shorter comics now, um, but they're not necessarily more realistic in any way. But there were a couple things I did. Um, this guy, Davey Rothbart, did this project called Found Requiem for a Paper Bag that I just thought was absolutely amazing. Um, and he asked me to participate in it. And I was just, I don't know. I, I did something that was a lot more grounded. Every once in a while, I'll do like a small five-page comic that is a lot more personal. But, and, and I don't mind doing that at all. And I love doing that. But I also, I don't know. I, I really love humor and fiction. Like um, those, those, those comics, the five-pages that I do, are really very straightforward experiences from my life. They're very, um, they're very direct. Like you know, I, I guess for me, the stories that I kind of that challenge me a little more, um, and where I can hit larger themes are through fiction um, because my, I don't feel that in my regular life. I don't know. Like, there's something about. Um, hitting those larger themes where, you, where your everyday doesn't quite make you feel like it's a proper thing to attack those larger <laughs> larger things that you're going for. So that's kind of why I like um, the, the absurdity of where I'm able to go with comics. <laughs> so I, I have two questions. The first is, do you use like computer tools to do your drawing? And if you do, what tools do you recommend for a beginner to use? Whoop. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. I for what I do is um, I just you know pencil and ink now on Bristol board instead of the cheap paper that I used to steal from the offices, just get, you know, a nice Bristol board um, for comics. And um, I use this um, brush pen. There are certain kinds of brushes that are really recommended. It's easy to find. But I think there's um, a Pentel brush pen that I use. And I scan it in. And then I do all my coloring in um, on Photoshop. The reason that I do that is very obvious. It's because I'm colorblind. And uh, it's I, well, not like fully, fully colorblind, but I'm red, green, color blind, so I need to be able to switch it and be like, wait, that's green? Okay, <laughs> I, I guess I need to completely like, you know, take the eyedropper tool and figure out the color balance and uh, switch it out. Um, I, it really hit me when I remember coming out with the initial Johnny Hero cover for, from Ad House, and, um, and Dylan said, why is the, um, why is the street red? And I'm sitting there going, the street's not red. What are you talking about? And there's always stuff like that that really hits me. You don't know how afraid I am of the color green because I do a horrible job seeing that, seeing it. That like every time I'm dealing with skin color, I'm just afraid that like I'm gonna make people look sickly. You know, if you add too much green, somebody looks sickly. But I can't see that, <laughs> so I need to be like, all right, let's look at the color balance. Let's break everything in my head down to numbers. <laughs> So yeah, I do do a good amount of um, of my coloring in Photoshop, but a lot of my initial um, pen and ink and pencil work is is just on regular paper, scanned in. And then I also do um, painting, and the paintings that I do are acrylic because um, oils stay wet. And if I accidentally mix too much blue and yellow, I'm screwed. <laughs> All right. Oh, anything else, or uh, <laughs> am I done? <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.